Thank you very much, John. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, uh, John. As I say at the very beginning, with the two halves of the room, I feel like a bit like a Lib Dem here, facing both ways here. But I'll uh, political joke to start. But I'll uh, I'll leave the politics aside. Um, I. Uh, I used to be the health secretary once, and I'm now the, uh, officially the only person in the House of Commons who is a shadow of his former self, being shadow health secretary. But that gives me a useful perspective on policy as it's developed when we were in government and on current policy on mental health. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, to give you my perception, analysis on where mental health policy is from a, from a government and public policy point of view, and to set, up, set out some of the issues, the opportunities, the challenges as I see it. Just by way of introduction though, I couldn't think of anywhere better to be to celebrate World Mental Health uh, Day than with three organisations I care much about. This university, which I've uh, supported over, over many years, where my brother came to study. Um, Mersey Care, who I think are pioneering in so many ways in terms of the, uh, the, the services they provide, the innovation they bring to mental health services. And of course, Everton, uh, in the community as a, as a proud Evertonian. I have to say though, speaking from personal and family experience, I can't say that Everton Football Club has contributed to my mental health and well-being over my lifetime and uh, I think I could put in a rather large claim for damages on that front, but um, putting that aside, they are actually, I would argue, unique in football in terms of it, this Premier League football club still being what it should be, a club first and foremost, not a money-making entity, it is a club and that's what makes me proud about it. It understands its roots, where it came from and it continues to give back and that's why I'm so proud to, to support Everton but also Everton in the community uh, and I want to come on and say a little bit about the work they've done with Mersey Care as I think it does actually uh, offer us a beacon really in terms of how services need to develop more generally in the health service not just in mental health, but in physical health too going forward. And I'll, I'll, come back, uh, I'll come back to that later on. But first, just a big piece of, of context. Mental health, I would say, is the issue of our times. The big issue, the coming issue, if you like. But the issue that I think will come to dominate healthcare in the 21st century, alongside ageing and all the issues connected with ageing. And to, just to back that point up, I just want you to, to think about the era that gave birth to the NHS and how different it is from today. When the NHS was first created, 1948, life in the North West, and particularly in the community that I represent, Lee, you could argue was physically very dangerous. It was dangerous to your physical health on a day-to-day -day basis. It was a coal mining area. People worked underground. You know, every day there were dangers literally seconds away. But because of that, it was emotionally very secure. Because it was dangerous down there underground, it couldn't be every man for himself down there. People had to lock arms together to get through it, to support each other, to be there for each other. You couldn't have a, a kind of situation where everybody was looking out for themselves. And that spirit of solidarity was carried over into the streets above the mines in Lee. But it was something you'd recognise, everybody from the North West, the North East, Yorkshire, would recognise that strength that there was in those communities. So physically dangerous, but emotionally very secure. And the argument I would put to you today is that life in the 21st century is a complete reversal of that. Physically, life is far safer. Yeah, of course, there are still those infectious diseases, the inherited conditions we may develop. So life still presents physical dangers, but we are unlikely to get those through our work or our housing in the way that they would have done in the 20th century. But emotionally, our lives are far less secure than they were. In fact, insecurity is the modern condition. We are all living with much higher levels of stress, pressure and insecurity than our parents and certainly our grandparents could even have imagined such is the nature of modern living. The juggling of all of the different pressures that we have. The real worries that many of you, of people you will have, particularly the students as young people, thinking about how do you make your way in a world where house prices are what they are and uh, employment is not as secure as it once was. You know, these are modern issues, these are modern challenges. How do you 
look after your own children when you're worried about your elderly parents when they're living longer. These are the things that we're all dealing with uh, from one day uh, to the next. But I don't think the health service has yet caught up with that. It is still stuck in that 20th century mentality that forged the NHS in the first place. That mentality that infectious diseases, accidents, the, the physical dangers to our health were what forged the NHS. And that has always taken precedence. It has been the issue that has been at the forefront of people's minds when commissioning health services through the, through the decades, creating a situation where mental health has always been the poor relation of the NHS. Sitting on the fringes of the system, shouting for resources but never getting them. And that is, is sadly where we still are today. Because I can't say to you today that policymakers in government, in parliament, in the civil service have yet fully woken up to the scale of the mental health challenge that the 21st century presents. You know, it's still been over there affecting other people, out of sight, out of mind, on the fringes. But that isn't where it is anymore, is it? It's everybody's issue now. It's every family's issue because of the pressure that we're, we're all under. And that's why things are going to have to change. It is going to require a big rethink in the priority that we give to services, including in the way we fund services. And this change is overdue. I don't often, I, I made a joke at the beginning, I don't often give uh, Lib Dems much credit, but Nick Clegg, I will give some credit for what he said yesterday. He said yesterday that there should be waiting time standards for mental health in the same way that there are for, for operations. And that was a really important thing for him to say. I do challenge him actually for allowing mental health services to decline under this government, as I think they have. But nevertheless, if people say the right thing, let's not just be opportunistic and make political points. If he says the right thing, well then let's build on, build on that. There does need to be a big rethink. It was something that we put forward when the Health and Social Care Act was going through Parliament. Labour put forward an amendment to that act calling for parity between physical and mental health, legal parity. And that was accepted uh, by the government. I don't think it's yet been enacted, if you like, in its spirit, because we've seen mental health being cut faster than the rest of the NHS uh, in recent times. Uh, again, that's the old behaviour, the old behaviour that deprioritises mental health. But people are beginning to say the right things and, and are beginning to wake up to the scale of this problem. For the first time ever, we've had members of parliament stand up in parliament and admit to their own mental health problems. Now, don't underestimate what a major moment that was when that first happened, because you know, in any workplace in this country, it's not easy, is it, for people to walk in now and acknowledge a mental health problem. It's like it may have been to acknowledge having cancer in the 1960s or 70s. It felt like a permanent black mark. That's how people viewed cancer. That's thankfully changed. But it's not changed with mental health. And it's often described as the last acceptable form of discrimination. Again, this is, these are attitudes that are going to have to change. And, you know, the reason why, I'll tell you why MPs didn't acknowledge mental health problems, because until only two years ago, it was the law of this land, the law of this land, that you could not be sectioned under the Mental Health Act and be a member of Parliament. If you had ever been sectioned under the Mental Health Act, even if it was years ago, that disqualified you from sitting, taking your seat in the, in the House of Commons. But not just that, it disqualified you from being a company director, from serving on a jury, and also from being a school governor. That was the law. And the law of this land was saying, only two years ago, that essentially, there was no recovery with mental health. Now, what a message for us to send out as a country from that level. And thankfully, that's changed. But it's only the beginning of a, of a major change that we need to see. I think things are beginning to move in the right direction, but public policy now needs to catch up. I will just put, my talk was meant to be about problems, uh, challenges and opportunities. So let me give you the challenges. What have decades of this thinking left us with in 2014 in terms of a kind of public attitude that deprioritizes, even stigmatizes mental health. 
So let me, let me say to you what I think the problem is with mental health services in, um, in, in England today. The first problem is a culture of separateness in the way services are provided. And to be honest, this is centuries old. It's not a, a 20th century phenomenon. It goes back deeper than that. The idea of the asylum, the, a place that is shut off from everybody else, shut off from society, almost like a prison, where people with mental health problems are taken away. That kind of attitude to mental health persists. And I think it partly explains why even today, in the National Health Service, we have organisations that are separate when they're providing mental health. They are separate organisations operating out of separate buildings. And that is a problem. Why is that a problem? I'll tell you why. Because if you, throughout the course of your life, have cause to spend time in those institutions because you've had mental health problems, the chances are that your physical health will have been neglected because there isn't physical health services on site in those places. And it explains the terrifying and awful statistic that people who have a history of serious mental health problems are still likely to die on average 15 to 20 years younger than the rest of the population. It doesn't completely explain it, but it partly explains it. And that's this culture of separateness in the way we provide services. I'll just quote you something. I'll go back to the start of the National Health Service. The founder of the National Health Service, Aniron Bevan, said in 1948, when he was describing his NHS that he wanted to create, this was his exact quote. He said, said this, I think that a, good, a great deal of mental disorder could be prevented from developing in its earliest stages if people were able to walk into the same institution for advice for mental disorder as for a corn on the foot. That's what he said. It should be as easy to get help as for going for a treatment for the corn on your foot. But that has never been a reality, has it? That has never become a reality in his National Health Service. That separateness that he was talking about there, an incredibly far-sighted man in so many ways, has nev was never challenged and actually took root in his NHS. And it's one of, that's the first problem I would, I would point to. The second problem we've got is what I've touched on already, that mental health remains a poor relation because it's not been the big funding imperative. You know, cancer and other things remain the big thing that, that dominates the call for funds. So today, mental health is still the poor relation when it comes to funding. And it's the case. I mentioned the crisis in mental health under this government, and I'm afraid that is what it is. Every day in this country, there are people travelling hundreds of miles, and let's remember, highly vulnerable people, travelling hundreds of miles to access crisis beds because they are simply not available uh, in most communities. And it is also the case that in the last few years that half of the people that have been referred for psychological therapy by their GP haven't actually received it. It's never actually been delivered because the, the, the waiting times were, were, too, uh, were too long. So that again tells you that this, this service is still the poor relation. The third problem with the way the NHS is at the moment is, is actually, I would say, arguably the biggest problem. And it's this. In 2014, we still have a medical model of provision. And this applies to all healthcare services, not just mental health. But I think it's particularly damaging when it comes to mental health. So what do I mean by that? A medical model obviously sees a problem, a, treat, a, a problem to be treated rather than a person behind it. So a medical model of support offers a prescription before it offers therapy or counselling, let's say. And that is a massive problem that we've got today. And what am I talking about? Let me, let me illustrate what I'm saying through a statistic that is you know, literally terrifying. What does that statistic tell you? I think it tells you two things. Number one, it tells you that there is massive rising demand out there for mental health services and support. That there is huge demand out there and it's going up and it's going up exponentially. But it also tells you something else, that there's a lack of alternatives to medication. That medication is the thing that's dished out first. That's the product of the, the medical model we have where a GP sees somebody and doesn't have immediate access to counselling or to therapy. 
because there's long waits for it, because these things have been underfunded for years. So what do you do when someone's in real crisis in front of you? Well, you do something, you give them an antidepressant, but often it's not the best thing for them. And that is the model that we've got today. We've got a medical model uh, of support, and it doesn't actually get to the root causes of people's problems. It, it manages, or even worse, exacerbates their problems by making them dependent on prescription medicine. In my constituency recently, there was a uh, survey done of people on four or more prescription medicines. And do you know what happened? It was terrifying because it revealed something that people hadn't quite realised, that it wasn't just that there were people on four or more prescription medicines, there were people on 12, 13, 14, 15 individual prescription medicines. Because that is the product of a system that just, when you go and seek help from the NHS, it gives you another prescription. And people have layered up this stuff. And once you're on 15 prescription medicines, you ain't going to recover your control and your self-esteem and your life back, are you? You're really not. And that's what's got to change. We've got to move from a, a medical model to a social model. We've got to have a system that doesn't see patients but sees the person. And there's a big difference between those two things, isn't there? Patient-centred or person-centred. A patient-centred system kind of sees people as a victim, if you like, someone to be given support to. It doesn't see that person as someone who needs to be helped to regain control, get back on top of things. And that is why the work that Mersey Care and Everett in the community have done with Imagine Your Goals is literally groundbreaking, I think. Because you know what? It does something very different to what a patient-centred NHS can't do. A patient-centred NHS, patient NHS just sees the treatment and the problem. This scheme starts with the person, and it starts with that person's passions. It starts with what animates them, what gets them going. You know, there are people like me out there for whom Everton Football Club gets us going. There's a lot more of us maybe than you might think, but that's what it does. And Everton in the community have also got a dementia project with Mersey Care, which works on the same basis. That if, if you start with those memories around football that people have, that sufferers from dementia have, that is what animates them. It's what gets them going. It's what gives them a bit of enjoyment back, a bit of excitement back. And that's the change I think we need to make in terms of the way we think about healthcare when we look then now at the public policy answer to what, what I'm describing. We need a social model, not a medical model. So what do I mean by that? I mean that when we go to the GP, you should be able to get psychological therapy, talking therapy, bereavement counselling, relationship counselling, whatever it might be, as instantly as medication. You should be able to get it that day. I mean, Nick Clegg was on the right lines, but an 18-week waiting list is no good to anybody when it comes to mental health, is it? You need it there and then, right there, that day. And that's what we've got to aspire to. A system where GPs can refer instantly into those social networks of support to get people help that very, that very day. That's the first thing that I think we need to do. I would give people rights to that support. Currently, in the NHS constitution, people only have a right to nice approved medication. Well, you need to give people the right to get therapy or counselling, because if, unless they have that right, you'll still have the whims of, of commissioners at local level who won't fund mental health because they still deprioritise mental health. So individuals need to be able to get a right to this treatment. The next thing I would do is require the co-location of physical and mental health services. In any A&E in this country, there should be qualified mental health staff on the ground in that A&E. Because what happens is people with mental health problems arrive in the acute trust and they find their mental health issues are not properly supported and consequently they will go significantly downhill and, and struggle. And that can't be right. We need the organisations of the health service to start working together and have their st staff jointly on the ground in the acute hospital. But also the reverse is true. If somebody in a mental health setting requires physical health support, that support should be brought to them, not left untreated. And that is another big change the system needs to make. Fourthly, I would say we need a drastic reappraisal of the importance of child and adolescent mental health services. I've talked about mental health being the poor relation. Unbelievably, children's services are the poor relation of the poor relation. The easiest target for cuts. Now, how can that be? If you think about the damage that 
untreat, an undiagnosed or untreated mental health problem in a child's life will have in terms of their future potential, but also the cost to everybody in terms of the likelihood then that they'll be in the criminal justice system or needing to su support via the benefit system. There was a report commissioned before the last election by, Lord, uh, by, by me and Alan Johnson, carried out by somebody called Lord Keith Bradley. I would recommend it to you. It looks at uh, criminal, uh, mental health in the criminal justice system. And it is an absolute indictment on our country that it found that seven out of 10 young people, adolescents in the criminal justice system, seven out of 10 have an undiagnosed or untreated mental health problem. Now, what an indictment is that? I mean, how can anyone in politics or parliament not feel ashamed, feel literally ashamed of that statistic? Because what that tells you is young people do not get the support that they need and then they are allowed to have their future taken from them, their potential squandered, and then they end up, uh, they end up in, that, in, that, uh, in that criminal justice system because no one prioritises that issue in the very earliest stages of life. And the last, the last implication I would point to for, um, for public policy in terms of uh, the change that needs to be made, I think we need a, a dramatic raising of our ambition on physical activity. I think a good physical activity policy is the first stage of a good mental health policy ready for the 21st century. It, it's clear from the research that's been done to support the Imagine Your Goals project, it's clear that taking part in activity, in physical activity, and also the social network that comes with that, has a dramatic effect, not just on people's mental well-being, but also then their physical, uh, their physical health too. We know it ourselves. If you are physically active, you start to make other healthier choices in your life. You start to drink a bit less, you start to probably smoke a bit less, you probably eat a bit better, because you've got a feeling of control back, you've got that sense of uh, well-being and I'm gonna when we do our public health policy as a, as a Labour Party in the next uh, in the next month or so I'm gonna put physical activity as the primary public health objective of our of our new public health paper why because again policy's got it a bit wrong in my view in the past it's all been a bit finger wagging don't smoke don't drink don't do, you know always a bit nanny state don't do this don't do the other Physical activity for me is the key to people's physical and men mental health first and then their physical, physical health. Why? Because it's the easiest change to make in your life. It's easier to move from physical inactivity to activity than it is to move from being a smoker to a non-smoker or a heavy drinker to a, a teetotaler. It's much easier to make that as your first change. When we were talking about the, the steps, I think the first steps to, to improvement, that is the easiest step that is the easiest change to make in your life, to become more physically active. But I think other things then flow from, from that that improve your mental and your physical health. So I would, to be honest, have the most ambitious uh, school sport policy. Kids should be doing activity every single day at school, not two hours a week, every single day uh, to get them into that, uh, into that way of thinking. 2% of kids cycle to school in this country. 50% cycle to school in the Netherlands. Again, we need a massive rethink of the way we give priority to these things. So then that takes me on to cycling. If we're going to have a real world-class physical activity policy, <clears throat> we need to start turning over some of our roads to dedicated cycle lanes. The time has come, I think, for that kind of change. <clears throat> because that is also about, not just about a healthier nation, that is also about meeting our climate change objectives. Let's get serious about these things. Make cycling much safer than it currently is. It's about reintroducing a policy that I introduced, free swimming. Why shouldn't it be as easy for anybody, regardless of their income, to go along and take part in physical activity and get the well-being, the sense of well-being that comes uh, from that? And to be honest, I would, I would ask for a much more structured expansion of projects like Imagine Your Goals. Through, the mental, through mental health trusts and through, uh, through commissioning. Because I think you need to have these person-centred uh, approaches in, every, in the health service, in every, in every community, where you ask music organisations, creative organisations, sports clubs to be the hosts of these programmes 
that are the things that in the end animate people. The health service has many great strengths and I love it very much and I will defend it with everything I've got. But it does have a one size fits all approach at times. And the way you get towards tackling 21st century health issues is if you really personalize them. If you start with people and what matters to them and then you can really then hopefully engage them in their, in their health. And I suppose the overall public policy objective that I would want to set is this. Everybody should be helped to become as physically active as they can be. That should be our goal. Everybody should be, doing phys should be physically active. And we should be helping everybody to get to a higher level of physical activity than they're currently at. That is the only way that we can rise to 21st century health challenges. It's the cheapest way, isn't it? If you spend money doing that, you then may make the health service financially sustainable in this century when ageing and mental health are the big challenges that we, uh, that we face. So anyway, I hope some of that is of interest um, to you. Um, all of this is in the context <coughs> of a national health service that I think is, is the best health service in the world. There is no doubt about it. A service that puts people before profits. And from the Labour Party point of view, the policy I'm putting forward going into the next election is a rejection of the market in healthcare. We need a health service that be, continues to put people before profits because if we let the market advance into healthcare, I think it's people with the most complex needs, the most challenging problems that in the end are the losers because of the cherry picking that goes on. So we must defend a public NHS based on people before profits. We must. But we must also acknowledge its failings and it is a medical model. <clears throat> it is a treatment model, not a health promotion model. And I'll finish with this. If you go back to 48 and the year that the NHS was created, the World Health Organization set out a definition of health as follows. And this definition still stands on the World Health Organization website today. Health is, quotes, a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Just think about that. Complete physical, mental and social well-being not the absence of disease or infirmity. For all of its strengths, the NHS has never been set up to achieve that. It's been a treatment model for 66 years. And what I am on a mission to do is ensure that in the 21st century, we have a, a national health service that is up to the job of promoting complete physical, mental and social well-being for everybody. Thank you very much for listening. <clears throat>
you know, they see that as a, as a kind of almost like a discretionary part of what they do, whereas, as you're rightly saying, it should be non-negotiable, shouldn't it? It should be absolutely at the very top of their priority. Sorry. Go on. I would, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I can't... So if you're looking at, if you're looking at realignment services, you're right. Medical models should not be followed, but equally, the, the medical discharge of the right people to be able to do it, for these men to at least have a chance of being rehabilitated if you're going to work in prison, to be able to lead them back into life. I think, I think you're absolutely right, and it is a breach of, of human rights. I'm not going to argue against that. And I think the reason why, why do people like that fall between the cracks? I think that's because of this silo approach. The prison service doesn't see it as its responsibility and the health service doesn't see it as its main responsibility to fund that support for that person and consequently they, they fall, up, fall between the two. From a health service point of view, which is obviously my responsibility, the problem is, if you look at, when the health service looks at whether it should pay for something, it only considers the health service budget. So NICE, the organisation that I mentioned, that's set up nationally to, to consider whether or not something should be funded, it only considers it against whether or not it will save money or not, or it's good value for money for the health service budget. So it only looks at its own silo, if you like. What it doesn't do is look at public spending in the whole, because if it did do that, the health service would fund a lot of different things, because if you don't support people with severe and serious mental health problems, the chances are it will cost the criminal justice system a large amount of money, and yet we still don't make those investments, and it's, it's a complete false economy. In, in of course, and I agree, and I agree totally uh, with that. But I might just want to make a, an observation as well. I think prisons policy more generally is going in a, has been going in the wrong direction towards a more punitive and more unforgiving kind of position. The idea that we're not going to allow guitars or books into prison seems to me to be fundamentally inhuman uh, and you know if we're talking about creativity as a route to people to regain their self-esteem and their and their mental health to, to deny people access to uh, to to books and to, to music in prison seems to me to be a, another symptom of the same mentality that doesn't give people like that the support that they need Yeah, it's a really good question, and I don't want to sound, I don't want to make statements that sound as though we'll all be, because it's, you know, we are where we are, and it's, and it's not, not easy, but to show you that this isn't just easy in opposition to call for this, and not, you know, I, I did a lot on this in government, because improving access to psychological therapies was a programme that came through in the latter years of when we were in government, from 2006, six seven onwards, and this, this was to put in place a basic uh, thera therapy service in every in every uh, area and by the time we left government there was there was that had been fulfilled and it was variable it was patchy but it was there and it's been quite you know, my frustration with the current government I don't doubt Clegg's sincerity on it I think he is sincere on this to be fair to him 
but they've allowed, they have, the reality on the ground doesn't match up with the words at the top again, and that damages people's trust. It's got, I've watched as the waiting times for psychological therapies have got worse and worse and worse uh, over, over recent times. You know, it's, in some cases, it's gone ridiculous. The, service, the, the IAPT services, as we call them, have gone completely, um, completely the other way. You know, again, cut, underfunded. So how do you stop that, and how do you empower people within the system, regardless, why should it be anonymous commissioners making these decisions about whether or not you should get CBT when you need it? How do you stop that? And I think you do have to stop that. It can't be the case that people are kind of beholden to anonymous people in suits, in rooms that, you know, that are making these life-changing decisions. So my answer to that is to get that thing that I said about a right, make it a legal right in the NHS constitution to access therapy or counselling. Because I, I think it, it, that's where you got to get to, isn't it? You can't, you can't, it can't be random because it is essential. And we're not there where, you know, we're, at the moment, it, we, we're not there because people wouldn't be able to, to get it as a right. What you first got to do is invest in them so that then the right can be delivered. But the existence of the right would be a massive message to every commissioner in the country that you have to deliver this and you therefore can't cut this as your first target and easy target for cuts. I think, I think attitudes are changing. I do, honestly. I think they, do, they are. But you still find some very old-fashioned thinking in parts of the health service, as you're probably aware. So for me, the only answer is to go down the personal, personalisation route and empower you as, a, as an individual to be able to say to the NHS, I have got a right to get this treatment and I demand that, that right be, be given to me. Uh, because otherwise... People on mental health are treated as sec with mental health problems are treated as second-class citizens, and that's been the case for far too long. We'll just take one more question, then, if anyone has one uh, over there. Yeah. I'll take those, there's two there. I'll take those two, and then that, that yeah, that'll be it, if that's okay. So. Um, uh, with, um, coaching football, and uh, yeah, personally, I think we. Uh, What's it for? So I've got a temp and lessons in general and trust the system. I don't know if you know, so that's a hard problem. Um, I firmly believe that you know, you can get to the, the adolescent and the child early and train uh, coaches involved with junior sports and pick up on these problems. You know, a lot of these kids can respond to coaches uh, with their only uh, chance of to channel and receive some kind of support and guidance um, which would obviously um, stop um, a lot of future problems we mentioned before. Um, the, I kind of have, have a kind of vision where uh, there's a, you see a lot of sports clubs, uh, junior sports clubs, fancy for the same kind of funding and um, charity and then um, the premises stay empty for several days a week. I just wonder why sometimes we can have like a more central sports clubs uh, and great to train for the coaches, uh, especially mental health as well, so the kids can receive um, after school care in sports and arts, different kinds of things like that. Uh, and they could their only way of uh, picking up some kind of treatment as well. So rather than having a golf club or rugby club and whatever, having the same kind of funding and the same entity, why can't we have more um, specified clubs where kids can receive coaches from various sports and it's open every day of the week? There's a lot of families out there with uh, single parents or family figures yeah. that in itself can provide countless problems. I think there's a massive gap in the market where we can. Um, Useful and obviously what we're today to cover up these these problems. Well, I completely, completely uh, and utterly agree with you. Um, and the thing I've got to say though is is probably, you know, I suppose you'll find it a bit depressing, which is I'm you know as you probably pick up quite passionate about my sport, always have been. Having been a government minister though and seeing things from the inside, sport is seen as a uh, the lowliest priority of public, public spending government departments. It's kind of like, you know, it's, they see it, oh, it's voluntary, it happens anyway, it doesn't need any, any public support. And that's, that's the way it thinks, you know. It's the, as I say, it gets, school sport gets cut as the first thing to get cut. 
councils get their budgets cut, and the first thing they will cut are leisure centres and uh, sports facilities. I think this country's got it wrong on, when it comes to sport. If you go to France or to Holland or Germany, they have those kind of places, don't they, that you're talking about, multi-sport hubs at the heart of the, heart of the community, because I think there's just a, a simple understanding. And I think, it's, I think it's very true of working class communities, isn't it? You know, sport is often the, th the unifier, isn't it? The glue, the, the thing that pulls people together. True of the arts as well, I'm not saying it's not, but it's particularly true. The strength of those communities lies in, its, in the sports, um, sports clubs. Um, and yet they struggle to make ends meet from one, you know, one, one year to the next. The other thing you say is also true, is that all the evidence from around the world is that early neurological development is cr just intrinsically linked to how young people develop. So if you pile the support in in the early years of life, and I mean the very earliest years of life, the, the earliest months and years, you make a massive difference to people's... Um, people's uh, uh, potential and yet we still don't do that even even kids with identified complex needs mental health problems why don't they get the support that they need because we often have a situation where schools will say well or the education system we're not paying for that that's not our responsibility and the NHS says well it's not our responsibility to pay for the speech and language therapy and the consequence is again like the situation with prisons the most vulnerable, those with the most complex needs, fall between that, that gap. And no one is incentivized to pile in that support early, early on in their life. And that's got to change. So I, I, one of the things I'm saying is there should be one budget for children at local level so that therefore you have an incentive to invest early because all the savings would then come back to that single, single budget rather than people holding different pots and then arguing about who makes the investment. So that's one thing that, that I would do. But the other thing is to say that sport needs to have a much bigger priority in public policy at local and national national level it can't be you know it is as you say the thing that builds people doesn't it it builds all of those values those skills the confidence as well as the physical and mental health that comes from it and why we continue to allow it to be deprioritized in public policy terms i I, all I can say is I saw the civil service at its worst and it was very resistant. To, you know, it doesn't see sport as, a, uh, sport as a priority because I don't think it understands working class communities, to be honest. And that's why it doesn't, it just thinks, it thinks that most communities are wealthy enough to provide their own sport. They don't need any help with providing sport and physical activity. But sadly, the reality in, in much of the country is that, that, that they do. But for me, just to finish off, I mean, what... We still live in a country, sadly, where the postcode of the bed you're born in still pretty much determines where you end up in life. And there are kids growing up in communities in our country, that, communities that have the biggest challenges. I think as the graph was saying when I walked in about education and employment, and it is, it is predictable that those kids are gonna be the kids, the adults with mental health problems, isn't it? It's totally predictable. And I just think you have to have a massive rethink of public spending and public priorities. If you really wanna change those statistics, you can do. The evidence is there. We know what to do. You've got to intervene early in those communities and in the lives of the people who live there if you, want to make, if you really want to make a difference to those figures. And sadly, yeah, we haven't had the political consensus to do that. But that, that I think, is what, what, what you need to do. And rather than delivering well-meaning things that people might not want, facilities that invest in the things that people want. And pe people in every community that I know want good sports facilities, good leisure facilities, good... Um, uh, <laughs> good libraries, all those other things that are currently being wiped out by the financial crisis. So anyway, long answer, but you've raised a really important question. Was there one more? Then I'll that would be, yeah. let you get your coffee. I was trying to make a point about the sort of the NHS and I work within mental health um, trust. You made reference to it going a bit more like business and competing for work and stuff. And I just wanted to, you made reference to how we reduce that, the, the impact that it has. So I was just wondering how you're going to do that because within the NHS, it feels like that's gaining a lot of momentum and yeah. a lot of energy, and that's the way we're going. And I'm just wondering how you're going to slow that down and potentially stop it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a, a good, good question to ask. Um, to finish on, I mean, I'll be honest, 
the, own, the government of which I was a part let the market in too far. I think it's let it in, all governments, let's be honest, into education too much. I, mean, I don't know what John would think about that. But the market mentality has certainly crept in far too much into post-16 education and even arguably into schools now, where schools are competing. You know, schools are almost at each other's throats, aren't they, in terms of competing. And I am determined that that's not going to, to take over the health service. So I, we let it in too far, in my view, and I was trying to change that when I was health secretary. But this current government, if we open the door, they've taken the door off its hinges with their Health and Social Care Act. You know, they're, they're mandating competitive tendering now in the health service, as they did in local government in the 1980s. And that's why, you know, that's partly why you're seeing the changes that you're seeing. And if you break the system always down into its like little bits where the Mental Health Trust is like a now, its own little island now and it has to compete and it has to get its patients, that mentality just starts to take over, doesn't it? And everyone starts fighting their corner rather than the, working for the greater good. And then that exa exacerbates the issues that we were just talking about in respect of nobody looking out for the whole child or the whole person, but actually just fighting these kind of territorial battles for their own organisation, not, not for the community that they, that they serve. And you know, I, I think generally, I've thought a lot about this, um, the market has been allowed to take over nearly every part of our national life. This idea, and there's almost been, I've seen it in Westminster, almost like a kind of feeling that it's just inexorable, so why don't you just accept it, as though the market is, because in the end, going to take over everything. And, you know, we've seen it in railways, we've seen it in utilities. Have they delivered better services to the public in the end? I, well, no, and I don't think the public think that either. Certainly more expensive. Better? I don't think they do think that either. And for me, when it comes to healthcare, the care of people, the market mentality in the end is anathema, I think, to that. Because health services are different, highly complex. Also, the ones with the greatest needs are the ones who need most support, but they're the ones that at least attract, as I was saying before, the least attractive people to the market. So that consequently, those who most need it start getting less support when you allow a market mentality to take hold. But also healthcare services, need to be there every day in every community. They, they can't be here today, gone tomorrow, market entry, market exit. You have to have stability in those health services. You know, they have to be there every single day, their essential core emergency provision. So I've tried to reposition our policy significantly in saying that we need an NHS based on collaboration over competition and based on people before profits. And we would legislate to repeal the current Health and Social Care Act and restore the, the public NHS as the preferred provider of services and give a permission to the system to, to integrate, to, to collaborate, to merge. You know, health service organisations, like I was saying, need to be working in deep partnership with each other, not competing with each other. So you have to kind of signal that that is what we want you to do, to integrate, not to do not to go the other way and pull yourselves back and go into kind of competition with each other. So I honestly, th to be honest with you though, I think this coming election is the last chance to win that argument on the health service, I honestly do. If you have five more years of what we've currently got, in, this is a political point, but I'm gonna make it, I think in the end, it will destroy everything that's precious about the NHS. It is still today a service that when you walk in the door, it's who you are that matters. You know, it's, it's what your needs are that matters. It's not, not your bank balance or anything else. And that is why people trust the NHS so much. And I think it's so important when it comes to mental health. It's, it's, even, it's more important when it comes to mental health that that trust is there at the heart of the system. And if we lose that, we'll never get it back. And that's why you know, there needs to be a real proper debate about the future of the NHS. And you know, I'm, I'm very clear now, I'm nailing my colours to the mast in saying you know, we, we must protect that that people before profits ethos that's at the heart of the NHS. And I think that's what Danny Boyle was celebrating at the Olympic, Olympic Games. If we let it go, we'll never get it back. And that's why, you know, from my point of view, I'll be kind of fighting every day until this next election to make the NHS the top issue and to, to make sure that, um, you know, we get, um, we get its fundamental values safeguarded for the rest of this century.